going together, singing.
uh, able and interested to come join uh, together for prayer, and then um, the usual uh, cornerstone kids on Tuesday and youth on Wednesday. Um, kids excited there with the cornerstone kids. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, obviously those who come, obviously welcome to come, and those who don't, you can feel free to be praying for those things that are going on uh, during the week. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to, to worship, but we'll, we'll sit for this song and then we can, uh, we can sing it.
heart and my soul. Lord, I want to live for you. Amen. God, please have your way in us. Lord, have your way in me. It's not what I would think or what I would want, but for your will and your way. Take us and use us. That every breath that, that we take and every moment that we're awake, that you would have dominion and you have control in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God and we can trust you that when we surrender to you and when we follow you, that you are good.
on our minds and hearts many burdens, many situations that are unresolved, um, many questions, many doubts, many fears, many uncertainties. And what a privilege it is, Lord, to bring our true selves into this place and to say, Lord, we need you. To say, Lord, you are our only hope. To join with our brothers and sisters who are equally frail, who are equally fallen, who are equally redeemed, who are equally spirit-filled, and to say, we choose at this moment to meet as a family and to worship you. And there is power in that, Lord. I know that Satan wants to get us on our own. He wants to get us isolated. He wants us to think that we're the only ones, but that's such a lie. And uh, Lord, I just lift up my brothers and my sisters this morning who are here or who maybe later on are watching online. And Lord, I thank you that you see, that you know, that you care, and that we're here for a specific reason. Lord, so we just lift up to you our unresolved situations. We lift up to you our questions, our concerns. And Lord, we say to you, we don't need to have them resolved, but Lord, we leave them in your hands. We cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. We turn our worries into prayers for our world, for our community, for our families, and for ourselves. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So my name's Dan, and uh, I'm one of the pastors here. I'm part of the pastoral team here. Um, and it's great to have you all uh, joining with us this morning. And uh, if you're joining online later, um, it's great also to have you. We're, we've made a decision. Uh, I, I'm not yet into the sermon, and we will have... have, have um, our video in a sec. But I do want to say that we're not at the place where we can live stream yet again. Is this ever going to happen? And there's just been a bunch of circumstances. Our Wi-Fi is sorted out, our internet sorted out, but uh, we are going to be having some, um, uh, some team member changes happening over the next little while. And so the best thing that we can do for now is to, is to record. And so we have our recording team there and, uh, and then, to, and then to do a little bit of video editing so it looks halfway decent, and then to put it up online. So, so that's what will be happening for the foreseeable future, just to, um, just to uh, what, manage everyone's expectations. But our goal, of course, is that we will be um, moving towards the live stream again at some point in the future. But we want it to be good before we do it. Okay, so we have uh, our team, our staff, um, our volunteer team are, are working hard on trying to come up with a solution that works for everyone, okay? So that's that. Let's, let's have the video, Paul. Our scripture today is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 12 to 22. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light, and for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. 
immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I think I put down my clicker somewhere. Can, is it on that pew? Or is it, uh, Stacy, if you wouldn't mind locating it, that would be awesome. Just checking my pockets. It's, uh, maybe it's at the back. Is it, is it at the back there? What are we looking for? Clicker. Like, what does it look like? Black, small, plastic, <laughs> shiny. <laughs> eh? Yeah, oh, thank you very much. Everyone give Stacy a uh, hand. <laughs> this is the other duties as assigned. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, no, it, that's the wrong one. It is. It is. You know what? I'm gonna unpl- I'm gonna undo it, anyways. We're gonna edit this from the ser- from the service later on. I'm gonna look so with it when this goes online later on. Can you uh, take that thing out of there? Thank you. All right. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> oh. I have to turn my mic on. There we go. All right. So when you meet someone uh, for the first time, one of the things that you often ask them is, first of all, how do you do? Or, hello. You know, in, in, in the olden days, you'd say, how do you do? But then uh, probably quite quickly after that, the second thing you ask them is, what do you do? And when we ask this question, what do we do? What we're trying to do is we're trying to narrow down things. We're trying, you know, so you have someone that you've never met before. And uh, thank you. And out of all of the world, you're trying to figure out how do I categorize you? How do I, how do I make sense of you? How do I know where you fit? And one of the ways that you do that is to ask, what do you do? Yes, there we go, nailed it. And really, it's not a great question. There are many, many better questions we could ask than what do you do? But, you know, we live in society, and one of the things that society has taught us to ask is what do you do as one of the first questions that you ask, which means how do you spend the majority of your waking hours of your day? That's really what we're asking when we ask someone, what do you do? Uh, Maybe it's a page job, it's a blue collar job, it's a white collar job, or it's an unpaid job like a parent or a volunteer. But what do you do? And the answer, like I said, that we get helps us to categorize them, helps us to place them in this, in, in the 8 billion plus people who live on earth, somewhere in the matrix of meaning that we've created in our minds and in our society. And I find that one of the great ways to shut down a conversation, at least in my own opinion, is to answer the question, what do you do personally by saying, I'm a pastor? Okay, that will shut down a conversation quick because if they're not religious at all, then often they're so focused on whatever reigning in their language or or something that they're hardly saying anything at all. And if they are religious, but they're not maybe Christian, then it's a whole other awkwardness because then you're trying to scramble for points of connectivity that maybe don't exist. You're a Christian? I'm a pagan. No way. What are the odds, right? It's just awkward. It's weird. You're not sure what to say. And if they are religious and they're Christian, but they're not your particular stripe of Christianity or my particular stripe, then the next five minutes is about them trying to feel out where exactly you are on the map. Okay, so what kind of pastor are you? What kind of church do you pa- pastor? What, what brand of of the faith do you preach? Um, in, in other words, you're, you're trying to figure out, are you like me or are you not like me? Um, in fact, just this past week, I met another professional Christian like myself, and I love it because within two minutes of meeting her, she said to me, I was born again in Oxford, England. And as soon as I heard these words, I was born again, it helped me play. She saved me from a lot of are you like me or are you not like me? Because when she said, 
I am born again. It's a code word that we in the business use to uh, try to uh, identify if you're a Christian like me or if you're not a Christian like me, if you're one of those other types. So after I knew that she was born again, we were incredibly free in our conversation. So yeah, what, what do you do is a very useful way to get to know someone, just enough to start to outline them. Uh, we've not shaded them in yet, but we have an outline. Um, and it works. It works. Nowadays, though, in many circles, uh, the first thing you know about someone isn't their job. The first thing that you know about them is often their preferred pronouns, right? On social media, under someone's name, often you'll see these words, she, her, he, him, they, them. And when you see this, you're learning something important about them. It's the first thing that they want you to know about them. And in this case, the old question of what do you do isn't nearly as important as the question, how do you identify or how should I address you? It's moved from a question of vocation to a question of identity. We're on week three of uh, our Epiphany series, New Year, Same Promises. Uh, week one, we looked at the different voices of the Lord. Uh, last week, we, uh, we, look, we found out about God's promise to give us a new way to see and a new way to say as we trust in him. And this morning, uh, we're going to encounter a Jesus who not only lifts us from the pit and sets us on a rock, but who also calls us to himself um, as he calls us to follow him. So our focus this morning is we're called by Jesus and we're called to Jesus. And we're starting with an account that may seem familiar to some of us if we went to Sunday school, uh, which is the calling of the disciples, the calling of the first ones. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 says this, as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them immediately. They left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and onwards. Now, this scene shows Jesus inviting Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and then James and John, uh, to evolve their calling of fishing for fish into fishing for people. Now, I used to sing a song when I was at Sunday school, and it went like this. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. Sing along. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me, if you follow me, back to the beginning, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Maybe we'll have a song every week in the sermon. We did last week, we did it this week. I think it's good. Now, at that time, I didn't know what fishers of men meant when I was eight years old, but it's powerful because Jesus gives them an invitation to follow me, and the four men leave their family businesses, they leave their livelihoods, and they follow a scrappy rabbi into the uncertainty of the future. Now, the first thing to note is that Jesus, he can do this. Jesus has the charisma and the power and the lordship and the, and the engaging you know, personality, he has the je ne sais quoi, he has, you know, the Godheadness to get people to stop what they're doing and to start doing something brand new, something that might not make a lot of sense to the people watching them from around. Things like maybe relocating to a different part of the country or humbly serving a family member who needs 24-7 care or going to the mission field or offering to pray for a colleague at work or taking a lower paid job or saying no to the promotion on ethical grounds or continuing to pray in faith for a seemingly hopeless situation or showing grace to a friend who has mistreated you or tithing on your income or starting up a friendship with someone at work who's a bit awkward and doesn't seem to fit. When you follow Jesus, he asks you to do things like that, things that don't make sense to people around you, because Jesus has the power. He has the innate creator of the universeness that he can do this, to say, follow me, and we follow. Now, obeying Jesus rarely makes sense, but the cool thing is, is that when you choose 
to heed Jesus' call to follow me, you are in effect absolving yourself of responsibility as to the outcomes. If you don't follow Jesus, then it's on you. But if you do follow Jesus, then it's on him. This is now his responsibility. It's his reputation that's on the line. Let's, let's go back a bit to verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, as we continue to look at this, pack, uh, this passage this morning, I want you to imagine that Jesus is the purulator guy. He's the delivery guy. He's the Intel com guy. He's the FedEx guy. Whatever delivery service you use. And like any delivery, Jesus has an address. He knows where you live, and he has a package for you with an envelope attached to the package. He has an address, he has a package, and he has an invitation. And the package that Jesus is delivering in this passage is verse 17, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now for many of us who've grown up in church, the word repent is often communicated like a threat, right? Repent or else, turn or burn. Repent or bad things are going to happen to you. But the word repent, and yes, it's often paired with turning for sin, from sin, but the word repent means change the way you're looking at life. Change the way you're looking at life. That's what the word repent means. It's the word metanoia. It means see life in a new way. It means get a new perspective. And of course, we talked, talked about getting a new perspective last week. But here, the new way of looking at life, the new perspective that Jesus is inviting you into is to see that all around you is the kingdom of heaven, that it has come near. In the person of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is here, but you've got to open your eyes, you've got to repent in order to be able to see it. So repentance is a gift. It's a package. And here's the thing, if you look around you and all that you see is war and bills and relationship issues and vacations and tax season and your next binge watching show, then you're seeing wrong. You need to repent because all of that is seeing wrong. But Jesus comes up to you with the rest of the disciples and he says, here's a package that has your name on it. Why don't you open it and see the world through new eyes? Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And friends, in front of each and every one of you this morning, there is a package called repentance that is ready for you to open. But of course, to deliver a package, you need an address. And uh, Jesus, like any courier, has an address. It says this, When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Matthew chapter 4 verse 12 and on. Now, this address could not be more specific, right? Land of Zebulun. Land of Naphtali, along the road, by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And I even put the postal code. That's the postal code for modern-day Nazareth, okay? So that's legit. It's an address. And this single verse, this, this, this one verse, is full of important information and meaning. You see, what happened earlier in 732 BC is that the Assyrians came... And we talked about this during our last series, and they overran Israel. And because of where they were positioned, Zebulun and Naphtali were the first regions to be absorbed by force into the Assyrian Empire. But in Isaiah chapter 9, which is quoted here, God promises that these two regions, Zebulun and Naphtali, will be the first ones to experience future freedom. They were captured first and they will be liberated first. And so Jesus comes along and he starts his ministry by moving from uh, a region that used to be called Zebulun. It's not called Zebulun anymore, but it used to be called Zebulun. 
He moved from Nazareth, which is in Zebulun, then he moved over to Capernaum, which is in what used to be called Naphtali. And in doing so, he fulfilled a prophecy from 700 years earlier. Land of Zebulun. Or it says, the, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. For those living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And so Jesus leaves Zebulun, he, uh, he leaves Nazareth, and he moves to Capernaum, he moves to Naphtali. And in this area, in this whole area, the light of Jesus was starting to dawn. And as he sets up in the region of Naphtali, he's delivering a package that contains these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, this region has many skeletons in its closet. It's been subjugated. It's been dealt a, a harsh hand. They've not necessarily handled themselves the, you know, the best over time. And even now, this region kind of exists on the edge of society. It's on the periphery of Jewish society, and it has a strong Gentile influence. So it wasn't automatically accepted. And this is the region that Jesus comes to to set up shop in. It's a region with a shady past, and its present situation isn't really any better. And Jesus says, this is where I want to make my delivery. And then you think about the names, right? The word Zebulun is the word, means my struggle. And it dates back to Jacob's time where he has sex with his servant. And as a result, the kid that comes is called my struggle. Imagine that. Imagine having the name, this is my struggle. Or I, my name is, first day at school, my name is my struggle. Why are you called that? Let me tell you a story, right? This probably isn't in the top 100 of 2023 boy names. And Nazareth was in this old region of Zebulun. And then James Evans draws a conclusion or draws a connection that, that Capernaum is in Galilee, which is despised as this kind of redneck backwater out in the boonies. So it's a region which is despised. So you've got Jesus moving from Nazareth uh, in, in despised Zebulun, and he moves to, to Capernaum, which means my struggle. So really what Jesus' ministry was, it was a despised place of struggle from where nothing good could come. That was where Jesus delivered the package. That was where Jesus set up shop. And Jesus is like, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be hanging out. And so if you resonate with Zebulun or Naphtali, if you feel that you're on the periphery, if you feel that you're left out or despised or hated or not understood, if your life is one of struggle, then let me tell you this, that Jesus knows where you live. He knows your address. In fact, let's say that together. Jesus knows where I live. One, two, three. Jesus knows where I live. Just think of one thing that you're struggling with have it in your mind and say, Jesus knows where I live. Here we go. Jesus knows where I live. Praise God. And so Jesus makes his way to your house. He makes his way to your neighborhood. He makes his way to your address of struggle and being despised. And he gives you the package which you, which you open. It's a package uh, with an offer to repent, to, to see life through a new way, to recognize that the kingdom of heaven has come near and it's on your doorstep. And so even now, friends, like in a very real way, Jesus is inviting you to open your eyes through faith and he will draw back the curtains. And where once was struggle and edge living and regrets and feeling despised, now there is a kingdom. And the light of this kingdom is shining. The light is dawning. And in Christ, you can actually become someone to be envied. And then finally, along with the package, Jesus gives you a message. It's an invitation. And as you open up that envelope, as you open up that invitation, you take out that piece of paper, you read this. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So we have Peter and Andrew and James and John who were fishing. They were doing what they'd been raised to on the Sea of Galilee in the ancient land of Naphtali. It wasn't a glamorous job, but it was good work. 
It put food on their tables, it kept their kids enclosed, and it put a roof over their heads. They were fishermen, they had their identity firmly placed in their vocation. And Jesus comes along to them and he says, you know what, I know that you're fishermen, I can see that in you, but imagine if you took that identity that you created in this job and there's nothing wrong with it, but imagine if you took that identity and it no longer became the most important thing about you. Instead, being a fisherman now plays second fiddle to something far more important, which is following me. In other words, Jesus is calling them to repentance. He's calling them to change how they're viewing life, to see life in a new way. And once they put on their God lenses, imagine it like a pair of glasses. Once they put on their God lenses, they start to see that God's kingdom is overlaying ordinary life. And they look around and where once they saw just nets and a boat and a lake and fishing, now they see God's kingdom overlaying everything because it's come near. And so in a sense, with Jesus' invitation, they keep doing what they were doing, which is fishing, but now they're doing it for Jesus. Jesus didn't say, okay, you were fishers of men, but now I want you to be an accountant for Jesus. That's what I want, right? He said, I want you to follow me and I want you to fish for people, meaning use the skills and values you've learned on the Sea of Galilee and apply it to kingdom building, catch catch people. He spoke their language. And it's worth noting that when he called them to follow him, Jesus didn't call them straight away to far-flung places, at least not in the beginning. Instead, what happened is he called them to their own people, to the people of Zebulun and the people of Naphtali, to the people of Galilee, which means that as they fulfilled their calling in Christ through his empowering, they then became this light that was dawning in their neighborhoods. They became the package of the kingdom that Jesus was now delivering to others. And they had a message which was, come follow Jesus. Now later they'd go further afield, but at the beginning they were still uh, fishermen who lived around Capernaum who still fished. They were fishing for fish, but now they're fishing for humans using the skills and values they'd learned in their secular job that could be applied to their new vocation. And remember that that this uh, new purpose in life came about because Jesus knew their address. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, along the road, by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. He knew where they lived. And he comes with a package containing a brand new worldview. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. A new way of looking at life, right? This is what we get to offer everyone, is a new way of looking at life with Christ on the throne, with Christ at the center. And along with that package was an envelope saying, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And Jesus is calling you to do exactly the same. He's calling me to do exactly the same. He knows where you live and he has a package for you. And he's inviting you this morning to repent, to metanoia, to think differently, to see beyond the holes in the fishing net uh, and the boat that needs a new coat of lacquer around it, to see beyond your checkered past, to see beyond Naphtali and Zebulun, to see beyond feeling despised and your struggle. He's calling you to see beyond that. He's offering this to you to see the kingdom. He's offering to help you see the kingdom. Not the person next to you, but you to see the kingdom. And I believe that if Jesus could call Peter and Andrew and James and John, then he's fully capable of calling you, right? He's at your door and he says, I have a package for you. And so friends, I invite you to open your eyes so that you can see the expanse of what God is doing across the world, but also here in North Gore. This is the gift, this is repentance, to see what Jesus is doing and then to accept his invitation to come follow me, simply to say to him, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do it your way. Now, these four fishermen, they didn't know where their yes to Jesus would lead. James was ultimately beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Peter was crucified upside down, while John lived to a ripe old age. But here's what I know. Regardless of the outcome, when they said yes to Jesus. They said yes to a life full of meaning, of purpose, and faith, 
an adventure, a life lived in the kingdom, a life that enabled them to leave an identity of struggle and being despised. They were no longer that. That was not who they were. And as we say yes to Jesus, as we choose to follow him, he becomes our identity. He becomes our vocation. He becomes the one who gives us value and meaning and purpose. We are now his. So let me close out this teaching this morning by asking you a couple of questions. How do you spend the majority of your waking hours? Or if Jesus met you in a function and he said to you, hey, I'm Jesus, and you introduced yourself and he said, nice to meet you, what do you do? What would you say? How would your answer to Jesus sound? Okay, just have that thought in your head. What do you do with the majority of your waking hours? Or how would you answer what do you do to Jesus if you met him in a function? Whether it's a paid job, accountant, custodian, teacher, farmer, you work for the government, or an unpaid job, stay-at-home mum or dad, volunteer. Hold on to that word, that vocation, that job. Now, maybe you're sat in your pew thinking, okay, my, my job isn't my primary identity. My primary identity, the thing that I want people to know first about me is my gender or my sexual identity, my chosen pronoun. Right? That's the first thing I want people to know, that I'm he, him, or she, her, or they, them, that I'm gay, or straight, or bisexual, or asexual, or pansexual, that I'm trans, or questioning, or gender fluid, or gender non-conforming, whatever it is. Whatever that identity word that comes to your mind, that this is the main thing that you want people to know about you when you first meet them. Hold on to that word, that phrase, that identity. And now, as you have that either vocation or that identity in your mind, consider that to be your address. Okay, this is where you live. And just like Jesus went to Zebulun and Naphtali, he knows where you live. He knows your vocation. He knows your chosen identity. He knows how you view yourself. And he makes his way into your psyche's subdivision. And he says, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the, sh- in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And he walks up to your house, this place where you feel safe, the place where you can draw the curtains on the world, the place where you can lock the door. And you see through the people that Jesus has a package ready for you. And, and it's it's it clearly has your name on it. And so you take the risk and you open the door and you open the package and it says this, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And you realize that this isn't a threat. This is a promise. This is a gift that Jesus is offering you the gift of changing how you see things of repentance. And you notice on the package that there's an envelope and so you open the envelope and inside is an invitation. It says, follow me. And it doesn't say, and I will make you fish for people. That's not what it says. That was the message for the fishermen. Instead, yours says, whether you identify yourself through your job, through your gender, or through your sexual identity, or some other way, choose to follow me. Submit your identity, to, your identity to me. Submit your vocation to me. Allow me to take it. Trust me with it. It doesn't have to all be fixed or left on the side yet. Just trust me with it. Follow me. Choose to make me first. Allow your identity to be me. Allow me to be your vocation. Allow yourself to be called by Jesus and called to Jesus. And as you follow me, we will work out the rest together. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali along the road by the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
As he was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, recognize that this world is so complicated and there are so many voices and there are so many opinions and i thank you lord that through that through all these call through 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 this noise that says make your identity your your vocation or make your identity your your gender identity or your sexual identity make that your main thing you say no don't let that be your main thing choose me Choose to follow me, and we will work out the rest. And Lord, I, I love that, that, that you take that identity, you take that identity, and you make that um, our qualification for ministry. That you take that and you use that, Lord, to speak to people that maybe pastors like me could never speak. So whether we're a, 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 a blue-collar worker or a white-collar worker, or whether we identify as straight, or gay, or bi, or trans, or whatever, Lord, you can take that, and you can redeem it, and you can lead us into meaningful ministry as we, as we repent, as we allow you to change the way that we see life, as we walk in your footsteps, and as we reject what this world says, which tries to make us so small, And instead, we can say we're loved by Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. And we're called by Jesus, and that's the only thing that matters. And as we walk forward, not having figured everything out yet, but walk forward in faith, one step step at a time, Lord, you will do incredible things. Lord, we thank you that you are trustworthy that your message is simple and your message is clear. Even a baby, even a child can understand it. Help us to have the faith and the courage to follow after you. No turning back. Amen.
as we go out uh, from this service, we pray that that will be our prayer throughout this day and this week. Lord, that we would give you all that we are, all that we have, and all that we have our ambitions, hopes, and plans, and lay them before you. Lord, we choose to follow you in those specific ways. And I pray that you bless us as we do that. 